And today, thank you so much, George, uh, for coming, George Kopitz, who will be talking about beaver money. And I have a, just a brief introduction about today's talk. So most of us are familiar with the image of beaver stamped on the Canadian nickel. In early Canada, however, the beaver pelt circulated as money and served as a unit of account to join indigenous, indigenous people and newcomers in commerce. This talk looks at made beaver currency supporting early colonial town economies and the French and English fur trades for centuries. Jory Kopitz, PhD, is professor of history at the University of Calgary. His research examines the history of human relations around trade, exchange, and cultural encounters. He's also interested in human encounters with the wild world, how the meaning of wildlife has changed in time, and how humanity has inter interacted with, found inspiration in, and frequently a com a commodified in trade the wild things around them. So George, thank you very, very much again for coming. I am going to stop my sharing and you're welcome to click on the share screen button, the green one. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, I am sharing a screen shot uh, of the little exhibit, a wonderful exhibit that's part of the uh, curated um, exposition around this series. Um, I'm really flattered to be asked to give a talk today. Um, Michelle Hardy, thank you for inviting me originally. I, it was a delight to receive your, your email back uh, last term and asking if I would talk about beaver money. Um, and Marina, Marina Fisher, who's been really integral in, in, in making this um, a talk happened. She got me into the collection to help me prepare. Uh, she's been stick handling, moving all this online. Thank you, Marina. Um, I'd also like to thank Brittany Dumon, who did the fantastic photography that um, later in the, uh, uh, the talk I'll share with you. Uh, and I, I, I guess I should really acknowledge as well the Nickel Family Foundation and its incredible generosity to the University of Calgary. Uh, Carl Nichols originally passion in numismatics and, um, and, and how that lives on in the collection here uh, that now spans some 22,000 artifacts that stretches across the ages. Um, so I am happy to turn this off so that I can be with you in person and um, you can see my face perhaps um, and all of my enthusiasm about this topic. Uh, as I said, uh, as, the, as the introduction pointed out, if I asked uh, all of you to rummage around in your pockets, you could probably find a Canadian five cent piece. And on it, you would see the Canadian beaver. And it's basically been there since 1937. And that's when the artist, uh, J.E. Kruger, designed his image of a beaver above pond waters. And uh, I went back to the Canadian Mint website where it lists each year's stampings of each of our pieces of currency. And I counted them up since 1937. And I estimate that there's been about 5.8 trillion of these little furry rodents uh, circulating in our currency ever since. And if you can't get more Canadian than having a beaver on our nickel, uh, maybe we can think a little bit about how many Tim Hortons donuts they've purchased as of late. Uh, but uh, I'm not here to talk about beaver being on our currency. I'm talking about uh, when, it, when it served as currency uh, and, and joined indigenous with newcomers, uh, indigenous peoples with newcomers, in the, mostly in the context of the fur trade over centuries. Um, and I suppose I could start by um, asking you, those of you who had social studies classes in junior high, uh, you'll remember that the fur trade was important uh, in our early economic history in Canada. Uh, many of you will also, rummaging around in your memories, will know that beaver was somehow important and beaver was supplying the hat markets back in Europe, France and England and other uh, uh, other places, um, and uh, you wouldn't be wrong in, in knowing that the beaver was important in the fur trade. Indigenous people traded all manner of furs to both the French and the English, whether they were fine furs like mink or marten or 
fox and the like, uh, but disproportionately and of most interest to these traders um, and, and occupying the most ship space going back to Europe uh, were beavers for the hat markets. In fact, in some settings, you could really just call it a beaver trade rather than a fur trade. And uh, some of that scale can be guessed um, in the 17th century, New France from Quebec uh, annually would export between 50 to 100,000 beavers. Uh, and that grew in the 18th century to grow from 100 to at times as much as 250,000 uh, beavers going back uh, from the port at Quebec to uh, French uh, port cities and then on to uh, Parisian hat makers. Uh, if you look at the, uh, what was happening in Hudson and James Bay in the 18th century, it was between 40 and 60,000 beavers being added to those numbers from New France. And given the, the dominance of beaver as a trade export, as a staple export from the colony, and in New France, it was the prime and most valuable export commodity for most of the 17th and well into the 18th century before economies started to uh, diversify there. Given its importance in, as a straight trade staple, it makes sense that it could serve the purposes uh, as money. Now, I'll address something of a, uh, a common misconception about beaver serving as money. Uh, it wasn't as if people were walking around with giant beaver pelts under their arms to buy goods and services. Uh, it did happen that a merchant with stock on hand might transfer beaver pelts to pay off some of his debts to another colonial merchant. That happened. Uh, colonial settlers in New France, who often had dealings with Indigenous people independently, sometimes had pelts on hand that they used to purchase goods from town traders and merchants. Uh, and even the Jesuit missionaries, uh, uh, for much of the time they were in New France, were accepting beaver pelts as tithes. But really, um, beaver didn't circulate much like, say, coin specie, metal, a metal specie coin might have, or other types of money uh, in the colony. Uh, if you look at what is actually uh, from our collection and on display, I'll share a screen here. Um, you know, this is a beaver pelt. It's in our, uh, as I said, this is on display. And this is a great thing to have because this really represents what was in the colonies. And before it was exported to uh, Europe, uh, it is not dressed. This is not a dressed pelt that a furrier could use. Uh, directly. Um, it is not even in a form that a hat maker could use at this point. It's basically a cured pelt. And what's happened uh, and what would happen is an indigenous hunter would trap the animal or kill the animal, uh, skin it, and then flens off the flesh from the skin side and stretch it on a hoop. These would be sewn into a hoop to dry and therefore preserve it for transport. And uh, this was called, um, it has, has a stiff quality to it. It's um, plasticky feeling on the back. It's also very cumbersome and heavy. Uh, the, the, uh, the English called this parchment beaver. Uh, the French called it castor sec, simply. And um, you can get a sense of it. It is one of the larger furs from the fur trade and uh, it couldn't really circulate much as money per se. Um, but in the case of, um, of money serving, or beaver serving as money, it could serve as a unit of account. And given its prevalence as a trading staple, and the fact that both indigenous people and traders and merchants in New France could apprehend a common value in the pelt, especially around what would be a winter primed adult beaver pelt, uh, you could derive a sense uh, of the value of this, uh, this commodity and apply it to all goods and services supporting the fur trade. Uh, in New France, this unit of, of account was simply called castor. 
but uh, in the English tended to call it May Beaver. And why it was called May Beaver as a unit of account, the May Beaver unit or MB that was often noted in documents, um, it's a little unclear. Uh, e. e. Rich, the great historian of uh, the fur trade, uh, suggested that the term May Beaver comes um, from the understanding that traders and indigenous people made all goods and services into beaver in their exchanges. Uh, and May Beaver as an expression came to um, uh, serve as, a, as to signify this uh, unit of account. And this was especially important uh, to have uh, to support the trade because with a unit of account, you could move from the strictures of straight barter. Straight barter is a pretty limited form of exchange when you think about it. Uh, many of you have this in mind when you think about the fur trade that, uh, oh, the, uh, say the uh, Anishinaabe coming out of uh, their winter hunting territories down to the coastal areas of Lake Superior in the 1720s to a French post or Europeans going out to their camps, you would end up with a pile of furs on one side and trade goods on the other, and both, both negotiated around an acceptable um, trade for each other's goods around those piles. That was straight barter. And it did exist in the fur trade. Uh, it was important in the fur trade. In fact, the early fur trade that got off the ground in New France um, uh, in the 1580s along the coastal areas of Gaspésie and uh, the Gulf of the St. Lawrence. These are all the ship side. Uh, traders would go on shore. They'd meet Mi'kmaq or um, Inu people of the, of the North shores of the St. Lawrence. And it was straight barter. But often when trade went into post settlement, settlements and uh, through permanent posts, uh, you needed other forms of exchange than straight barter. Straight barter often happened in a circumscribed period of the year. And in some posts it happened only, uh, only in over a couple days or a couple weeks of the year. And outside of that, throughout the rest of the year, the relations between indigenous people and these newcomers uh, had to depend on different types of transactions in which a unit of account understood by everyone was absolutely integral in importance. So uh, a very common occurrence, um, it happened in the spring when a band would come out to trade at a post. This might well have happened anywhere uh, in New France uh, among its various military post systems inland. They would arrive sometimes early in the spring before European goods even arrived at that post. And in those kind of circumstances, those indigenous people didn't, you know, return back to their camps carrying these great bales of furs and continued in their seasonal rounds. What they did was they left those furs to their credit at the post. And before they did that, everyone had to have a good, solid understanding of what was, uh, what was due to them in credit when they returned later in the summer or in the fall uh, to claim them. And that was derived in a made beaver unit. Uh, the other exchange happened in the fall. The fall credit system goes way back in the fur trade, probably early 17th century in New France. It extended well after World War II, where if you were asking indigenous people, especially boreal forest hunters, to devote any time to the fur trade and to devote any energies to move away from subsistence hunting towards trapping animals of a smaller nature and of the less food value, you were asking a lot from them. And indigenous people demanded credit at, in the fall to help them in their hunt during the winter. And the fall credit system, again, uh, the trader would advance goods, usually of a useful nature, kettles and ironware like chisels, ice chisels, uh, knives, axes were a big thing for the fall credit, uh, muskets, ball and powder, uh, with, in the principle that this freed up energy within a band 
to trap more fur bears that the indigenous people would return. And they always returned. It was very consistent in the trade that they returned in the spring to pay off their credits. And they usually brought a surplus from the winter hunt to purchase more goods at that point. And the other reason why you needed a unit of count, because the fall credit had to be counted for very carefully, it would be entered into the books about what Indigenous people were taking in credit. The other transaction that was absolutely important in the fur trade was demanded by Indigenous people in gift exchange. Uh, they wanted a sense of reciprocity. Uh, anthropologists might call it the, uh, forming the basis of fictive kinship. Uh, especially trust in their trading partners. And that was developed in a number of protocols before trade began. Uh, and one of the protocols was in gift exchange. Indigenous people brought gifts to the posts and Europeans reciprocated. And if the Europeans hosted Indigenous people at a post for the trade, upon their departure, more gifts would be given. And a trader had to keep track of all of these transactions. And essentially in what we call double entry bookkeeping, which goes way back and actually was part of the fur trade right back to Champlain settlement, 1607 uh, at Quebec. The merchants there were keeping up double entry in which traders would keep up a day book or a waste book, they called it, in which they would record every transaction with every individual or band in which they had business dealings. And in the day book, they would be careful to note whether it was credit, debit, straight barter, or gift. And then come near, end, near year end, and there was a year end, a business, the business year end in double entry was usually made 31st, and that happened in the trade way back. The trader would start to assemble his accounts based upon his day books, under general headings, and then move towards the ledger. And the ledger uh, at that point um, moved, made beaver units into, for the English, sterling units, or for the French, the French livre as a unit of account, of a currency of account. And this, these double currencies, the dual currencies, were in fact part of the fur trade over its entire history. Uh, in, uh, in that case, the uh, trader would balance one side of his ledger with credits, um, so add them up, and on the other side, debits. And whatever he needed to balance, the two sides of the page would show either a profit or a loss line. And that was important to him. It showed his standing in the trade. It, uh, it was important to his merchant partners, if he was French back in Montreal, or investors in France. The Hudson Bay Company insisted on double entry among its chief factors who were salaried representatives in Hudson and James Bay. They kept it up in order for the London Committee to keep track of whether a post was in profit or loss or just simply how it was doing. And so this unit of account in May Beaver in which every good and service was converted to the approximate value of a, of a winter prime beaver pelt became absolutely cardinal to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the fur trade, and it became longstanding. It was centuries old in duration. I find Dene in the Mackenzie Valley in the 1920s and 30s still doing their exchanges with traders in May beaver. There were some Canadian dollars in circulation, but uh, this was a far better system, more practical in the circumstances. And Brian Get Gettler, who's recently published a wonderful, I totally recommend this book, it's called Colonialism's Currency, in which he looks at the, um, the circulation of money in indigenous, um, uh, in, in indigenous economies and cultures over the course of Canada's colonization. Uh, he points out to the long standing, centuries old use of May Beaver as a monetary unit. And uh, to the point where he points out that it, uh, it became, became imprinted in, in, in indigenous, indigenous languages. Their familiarity of this type of unit for a sense of money with these newcomers uh, endures in Innu language, uh, Montaigne in present day Quebec. The word for 10 cents 
Ishpushkektue means half a beaver skin. And the Cree word for dollar is aete, or beaver pelt. And so there's this, this sense that this, this monetary unit was longstanding um, and of relevance and use for both indigenous people and Europeans who agreed on the value of this unit. Now, up to this point, we've talked at length about this unit of account. It's an imaginary unit, right? Uh, it's not circulating yet in form in our discussion, but it's clear how this imaginary unit could be transferred to trading tokens. Traders would sometimes provide wood sticks or pieces in woods with notches on them to indicate the May beaver owed to, a, to, owed to the post or uh, that an indigenous person owed to the post uh, in turn. And uh, essentially we see trading tokens uh, occurring generally in every site of, of trade, but often in places of competition between companies. And the fur trade basically ran uh, under the, the asserted monopolies of large companies in Canada. Hudson Bay Company had a monopoly of Rupert's Land that it, uh, that it asserted since 1670. In New France, it was the Compagnie du Nord who, that had a monopoly of the trade basically throughout New France. Uh, there was a separate company, uh, the King's Post System that it was called, uh, that was monopolized by a consortia of mer merchants up the Saguenay River. Um, but all of these companies in competition with, them, uh, with each other would tend to take recourse into, uh, into tokens um, and this to maintain a, uh, uh, a uh, maintain um, relations in the trade and capture the trade from their rivals. Uh, this is an example from the collection. It's my, it's my favorite actually. Uh, this was likely issued by the Northwest Company that um, became a dominant um, um, overarching company out of Montreal after the conquest of Quebec by the British in 1760. Uh, growing up in the 1770s, the Northwest Company dominated the trade out of Montreal and came into hot competition with the Hudson Bay Company traders. They were very um, uh, adept at providing trade silver that had made beaver value attached to it. And one of their pieces, this was likely struck by uh, Montreal silversmiths who specialized in trade silver. Uh, this is a quite literally a beaver token. <laughs> um, it's about three and a half to four inches long. It's a large one. They were struck in about half this size, but this one in our collection would have had a, a unit value of 10 made beaver. And it would have been, uh, provided, it, you know, it has a int high intrinsic value. It's struck in silver after all. But um, I can see these things being given strategically, not necessarily in large numbers, but especially in the parting gift to bands. I can picture a trader adding to the gift one of these items, either to the band or to, for the band to carry back to their camps to an individual of influence, a chief of influence that might, through this type of generosity, decide to maintain trade relations with the Montreal trader rather than a Hudson Bay Company trader. Uh, these circulated, uh, it's hard to say how many of them were redeemed in their face value. I, um, my, my suspicion is they might well have been caught up in indigenous gift giving. Um, the, the giveaway here is the little hole in the snout of the, of the beaver. It's to be worn around the neck or integrated into clothing. Uh, it might well have continued to be gifted within a band or with other bands uh, in gift diplomacy. Uh, the Northwest Company was pretty good at issuing tokens, but it also issued coin. Uh, this isn't from our collection. I took this off the net uh, for preparation of today's talk. Northwest Company also produced coin in silver like this one. Um, it bears the Northwest Company sign and the beaver. Um, it has a known unit value of one made beaver. It's stamped in 1820. 
Uh, the significance of this coin is that it's occurring just before the amalgamation of companies. Um, 1821, the Hudson Bay Company joined um, the Northwest Company and one company dominated the fur trade, monopolized the fur trade in Canada, uh, in, basically until Confederation. Uh, but here, these coins were mostly distributed in the Pacific Northwest after the Northwest Company uh, purchased J.J. Uh, Astor's uh, Fort Astoria on the mouth of the Columbia. It distributed these coins to secure the trade of Pacific Northwest people. And again, if you look at this one, it's got a hole in it. It's uh, to be worn around the neck. A lot of these coins ended up in grave sites, indicating that they probably weren't even redeemed. Uh, they were possessed and valued as uh, objects and uh, integrated into one's um, uh, own um, uh, relationship with the world around them or, um, or and confirmed relationships in their re-gifting within bands. Move along here to some of the pieces in our collection. We see the Hudson Bay Company. Uh, it started to issue coinage. Some of it was coming out of Hudson Bay posts and out of James Bay posts, um, often around particular moments uh, and often in the 19th century. Now, I mentioned that 1821, there was a single company, the Hudson Bay Company, that had amalgamated with all rivals. And there was one company prosecuting the trade. You might wonder, why is it that the company is releasing coinage in these circumstances? Um, the reason is, uh, if we look at this coin, you've got the regalia on one side, the, the fancy dancy uh, symbolism of the company uh, projecting its authority. Uh, but on the other side, you've got the markers of the, the token itself. HB means it's issued by the Hudson Bay Company and it will only be redeemed by the Hudson Bay Company. It has a face value of one eighth of a May beaver. It should be MB on the bottom. That was a, a, die, cast, a die cutter's mistake, uh, much to the embarrassment of the company. It should be MB, but it's one eighth of a May beaver. And at the, in the middle there, you see EM. And this, uh, this coin was issued uh, actually from East Main Post uh, on James Bay. It was, uh, it was uh, issued, um, early, um, why the, these coins started to come out of that East Main Post in the 1840s. This one was issued uh, probably by George Simpson McCavish, who was the chief ta factor of East Main. Um, and uh, the company is actually releasing this coinage at a point when uh, it's not dealing with trade rivals per se, uh, fur traders, it's dealing with resource colonialism occurring out of the Canadas and especially up the Saguenay River and even into the catchment areas uh, and the hinterlands of East Main Post. And so Simpson or McTavish was trying to maintain the trade with the East James Bay Cree at this point who might be tempted to go further south where there is now timber leases uh, provided by and timber monopolies now provided by the, Can uh, the Canada's um, to the south out of Quebec. Um, timber merchants were in the Saguenay and with them larger number of set settler colonials who were working for the companies, cutting down trees basically. Uh, but with them are shopkeepers who are purchasing furs. And so this money was serving as a means of attracting the trade and maintaining the trade at East Main or within the East Main District. And this was very important, the EM, that stopped you from using it anywhere else, among other Hudson Bay Company posts or in other districts. And it certainly stopped you from using it um, with uh, individual or private um, shopkeepers and the like who wouldn't accept it. Uh, we have a example of what we, uh, this is in the display, but basically they were struck in one, one half, one quarter, and one eighth beaver uh, face value. Uh, essentially, um, when you think about at this time, uh, an individual might uh, bring, oh, 15 to 20 may beaver of fur to a post, sometimes as much as 30. I can see these coins being given as part of the departure gift, um, maybe even just a few of these coins. Uh, and, and, and 
in the hopes that, well, in order to redeem these coins, you'll bring all of your furs back to the bay. Bring them to the bay. Uh, and I see them much serving like um, Canadian tire money. You know, they might have small value compared to the larger value of an entire fur harvest, but they're serving to return you to the place of issue to do more of your dealings. And you couldn't really use them anywhere else, just like Canadian tire money. Um, if you've accumulated a lot of it, good luck using it at Home Depot. This coin had to be used at East Main, uh, in the East Main District, and especially East Main Post. Um, after Confederation, something else happened to these coins. They were issued in sites in the North where you saw resource colonialism. After Confederation, the company lost its completely its monopoly. And by the 1880s, there's a profusion of free traders and independent traders uh, into Hudson Bay Company territories, uh, into the provincial Norths especially. Um, and in the context of competitions, and some of them were independent American or Canadian traders um, from Quebec or from some of the American cities who were bringing parcels of goods north, varieties of goods. Some of these traders were in fact offering cash sales. They were bringing American or Canadian dollars north with them by the 1890s um, and better prices on goods. Uh, in the, after Confederation II, there's a general movement in the fur industry that by the end of the century is moving fur from being a luxury item used by the few around the world to becoming a mass consumer, um, consumer item uh, used by the middle classes around the world. And you know, by the turn of the 20th century, you know, the belle époque of the fur coat and the uh, fur garment is becoming widespread around the world, that had the effect of raising demand for fur and also prices. So from the 1890s onwards, uh, fur generally escalated in price dramatically. Uh, muskrat, for instance, that might have sold uh, and fetched a value of 15 or 25 cents in the 1880s before World War I was uh, obtaining sometimes two to four dollars per pelt. And generally all pelts that indigenous people were trading were trading at a much higher value because competitors were making bids for it. They gained greater value for their furs. That's one change again. Um, the other change is that after Confederation and the advent of treaties, especially in the provincial Norths, treaties opened up indigenous territories to resource industries and resource extraction, vastly affecting them and undermining their own subsistence rounds and sometimes their very survival. Uh, by the 1890s in many areas of the provincial Norths of Manitoba, Ontario and Quebec, and especially around the James Bay catchment areas, uh, you see a widespread decline in caribou populations, in elk populations, in big game. Uh, there's hard rock mining that starts to take off uh, throughout the shield. There are clear-cut forestry for the pulp and paper industries in huge leases. There's commercial fishing. And all of this, by the 1890s, is undermining uh, indigenous welfare and health within their own territories. They're still pursuing their traditional ways of life on the land, but their subsistence hunting is made more difficult. And in this context, um, a couple of things are happening in the trade. And first, uh, the, the value of trade tokens increases. Indigenous people are deriving more value for their furs. And so we start to see, um, oh, Onion Lake um, in Saskatchewan, 1870s starts issuing its own coin, coin currency in the context of competition. Uh, uh, by the turn of the century, the, 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 the Labrador district is, is um, offering trade tokens that now are not just contained within one made beaver, but up to 10 made beavers in values. Uh, Lambsden and Hubbard in the Nunavut up at Baker Lake, turn of the century is offering coins worth one to five made beavers. There's just a general 
expansion of the face value of made beaver coins that is reflecting both the competition the Hudson Bay Company is facing, it's dispersing these things widely, but also reflecting the overall value of furs and the value of the fur trade to Indigenous people, and Indigenous people now engaging in the fur trade in a far more uh, specialized way by the 1890s and the turn of the century. Many Northern Indigenous groups are now turning to wage employment, but also the fur trade in order to derive goods that make the subsistence round more efficient, which is often prosecuted over larger territories. So the purchase of rifles, the purchase of uh, steel traps, um, and especially the purchase of canned foods or dry foods to support winter hunting that is now made more difficult in new circumstances in resource colonialism. All of this is now making the fur trade more important and the value of fur in indigenous hands is now increasing, ref reflecting, um, reflected in um, now um, in the coin currency. And that this this on display in our our, our, our collection is showing the the amalgamated St. Lawrence and Labrador uh, district. Oh, I think I'm uh, have to share the screen there. Um, this is the new currency by. Uh, 1922, uh, 23, um, well, the district amalgamated in 22, and then these are probably released in 23 or 24, but essentially it's showing this rising value in coin currency, one to 20 made beavers. And uh, in that period, fur is now um, shooting up in price, um, especially things like Arctic fox and the like. Um, now, the company always tried to discourage cash sales at its post. It wanted to capture both sides of a trade, both the purchase of furs and the sale of goods in the credits derived from those purchases. Uh, they profited in buying furs from the same individual, and they profited even more selling goods back to the same individual. And in the made beaver system and keeping uh, keeping sales um, in barter and in made beaver credits and uh, debits, they could often secure both sides of the trade. Uh, that ended if you started to purchase furs with cash and dollars from say Canada or the United States. Uh, with cash, an indigenous person could sell his furs to the trader and then carry the cash elsewhere to other merchants offering more variety or better prices, or even go to the settlements, to stores there to, to get even cheaper prices and use the dollars uh, in, their, in their purchases. Um, in the case of the Hudson Bay Company, it was had a stern policy to traders not to buy with cash on any occasion unless it was necessary. And so there were some posts that switched to dollars in the lower Saguenay uh, as early as the 1840s, but in in principle, the company resisted cash purchases well into the 19th century, but at various points in its frontiers, it saw colonization, increased numbers of outsiders in, its, in the purview of its, of its trading, um, and the circulation of dollars in the hands of its uh, trading competitors. Um, in, in Onion Lake that I mentioned, yes, uh, just recent, uh, just before Onion Lake, after 1877, was issuing made beaver coins. By 1910, it was impossible for them to do it, and they issued coins that had a representative dollar value. It still locked the person into redeeming those coins into trading with the company's post, but it it was in respect to the. Um, uh, the wider circulation at that point of dollars in the overall economy, and especially in the hands of merchants nearby. And generally, we see this, this, uh, this um, transition to um, money currency occurring where the money made beavers started to lose ground uh, by the 19, by World War I in some areas, after in the interwar years, uh, and essentially by 1946, just after the war, uh, the Hudson Bay Company decimalized its tokens altogether uh, in, a, in respect to the Canadian dollars. And these, uh, these tokens now 
1946 or afterwards are showing um, a denominational value of five to 10 cents to 25, 50, and 100. Uh, they're sometimes called Fox tokens because if you look at the square one here with a one, that's representing a now the, the, the trading value of an Arctic fox, uh, which has become after World War II and throughout the interwar period, uh, a very important trade item, uh, very, um, very valuable tra trade item. And especially in the far North and even among the Inuit, the prime uh, trade staple um, and the one most sought was, um, was fox, uh, fox in the trade. So um, what I've talked about today, um, just to summarize, um, money mattered in the fur trade. Uh, having as a unit of account, the made beaver uh, became a means of moving the trade beyond straight barter and elaborating relationships in exchange around other forms of transaction, whether they're credit or debit or gift exchange. Uh, in made beaver, both indigenous people and newcomers held the same understanding of value. And that was critical in the functioning of made beaver as money. Uh, largely, this was an imaginary unit that could be apprehended in the minds of individuals or in the books of traders in their accounting. But uh, the beaver money in our collection actually tells another story as well. Uh, beaver money as a unit of account to its solidified form. It could circulate with face value in trading silver, like the beaver, beaver effigy that we saw earlier, uh, in coins. Some of this coin and beaver silver uh, might never have been redeemed for their face value, but continued to circulate in gift economies. Uh, but meanwhile, in the 19th century, uh, even though having a monopoly after 1821, we see the Hudson Bay Company uh, issuing coin, often uh, in the face of resource colonialism in its frontiers and coming up from the settlements um, into the shield areas uh, uh, of, of, their, uh, of their trading factories. And after a confederation, especially when it lost monopoly, it was dealing with traders, competitor traders, um, to release more coin, to try to keep Indigenous people coming back to the, uh, to the, tra um, uh, to the, to the Bay for their trade. And um, by the end of the century, we see the, um, the inflation in the, um, or the, the rising value in the denominational value of this made beaver coin in re reflecting actually the value, overall value of the fur trade and its importance to Indigenous people negotiating a new reality uh, in Confederation in the period of treaties, and especially uh, less, less so in the North around settler colonialism, but the real brunt force of resource colonialism that's impacting their ways of life and especially their subsistence uh, and uh, survival in their territories, which now made the fur trade of importance to them in uh, in, uh, in the winter rounds. Uh, usually there are watershed moments in Canadian dollar history, usually when the made beaver was giving out to and being replaced by either pri private issue money or uh, dollars, um, uh, dollars uh, with representational value by states to the south in lower and Canadian governments or the Canadian government, especially by the 1890s. Um, these watershed moments were significant for Indigenous people in their encounters with uh, newcomers, and especially uh, as they continued to um, participate in the fur trade uh, over its very long history in North America. That's all I had to say.